Hello everyone, it's really good to be here with you once again as we bring our series on Ephesians to a close. We're in Ephesians chapter 6 and the last and probably most famous part of that chapter, the armour of God. Paul gets into his explanation quickly and he starts by telling us two things that we need to grasp about the armour of God and he does this before he gets into the detail of what it actually all is, what, what it's made up of. The first thing that Paul really goes for is this, he points out that it is essential and the next thing he does is he points out that it's excessive. We're going to examine both of those just briefly before we look at the different bits of the armour. So first of all I want to say this, the armour is essential. A few years ago, Debbie, my dear wife, went to America. She used to travel there a lot for business and she came back and she brought me a lovely gift. It was a pair of cycling glasses called Oakley Eye Jackets. Well, I put them on and I felt like quite the coolest dude in town. So wearing just those cycle glasses and my other cycle gear, I jumped on the bike and I went off for a ride. And as I was setting off from our gate, my neighbour over the road, Chris, the paramedic, called me over. And I went over to him and I said, oh, hello, Chris. And he nodded and said, nice new glasses. And I said, oh, thank you. He said, I just wanted to say, as a paramedic, I go to two types of cycle crash, of crashes and incidents on the road that involve cyclists. The first type, he says, is the ones where they were wearing a helmet and I pick them up and drop them off at A&E to be patched up and have limbs set. And he said the second type of crash I go to are the ones where, like you, they weren't wearing a helmet and I drop those people off at the morgue. And I stood there next to my bike and said, Chris, I'm going to just pop in and get my helmet on. A helmet on a bicycle isn't an optional extra. It is something that is for everyone who cycles. And Paul, when he says these words, is emphasising that the armour of God is for each and every Christian, not just some elite. This is what Paul says. He says, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on, he commands us, the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. It's for everyone and it's the full armour. Paul's use of a Greek word panoply means every last little piece. You can't be a renegade and just wear a bit of a, a helmet and, uh, and uh, carry a sword. You need the lot, says Paul. It's essential. The next thing he says is that it is excessive and it's easy to miss this. Listen to these next few words. For our struggle, he actually says our wrestle. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore put on the full armour of God. There's panoply again, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. So Paul talks about wrestling and I know at DBC we all love a bit of wrestling. Paul says we have to wrestle with evil. He actually uses a very specific wrestling term. He calls it parley. That was a type of particularly vicious wrestling. It took place completely naked and the two wrestlers would fight and the rules were simple. If you were thrown on your back three times, you lost. And if you were thrown on your back or down in such a vicious way as you could not get back up, you lost. Those were pretty much the only rules. And it was a brutal, brutal battle and match that used to take place. The uh, 
the greatest parlay wrestler of all time. It wasn't Big Daddy or Giant Haystacks or Mark Rollerball Rocco or any of the others that we used to watch on a Saturday early afternoon, but it was a guy called Milo of Croton. He was the seven times Olympic wrestling champion. He was a giant of a man. He famously once wrestled a bull and managed to pick it up. I can't even imagine. He would do things where he would straighten his hand and try to get people to bend his fingers and they could never do it and uh, on one occasion I think at least one he would put a, a thin metal band around his head and would sort of do this <clears throat> would flex his whole face and head and would would ping and break this metal band you wouldn't want to meet him in the January sales so is Paul saying that this wrestling match we have with evil is going to be against something vicious, terrifying, absolutely unbeatable. No, Paul is saying something quite different. Wrestling, parlay that Paul mentions, took place naked, but he tells us we have to be in full armour when we do it. Let me give you a modern equivalent. Imagine a fantastic world champion boxer stepping into the ring with his silky shorts and his lovely padded gloves and then into the other corner climbs i don't know a member of two para in his full battle dress carrying a large gun and he has every intention of simply shooting the boxer as soon as the bell rings you would obviously place your money on the fully armored soldier with the weapon and this is what Paul's describing here. He says, you're going into a wrestling match with evil, but you are doing it in a full panoply of armor and you are armed. So let's find out what all the little details of that mean. We're now going to explore the first two of the pieces of the armor that Paul talks about. He talks about the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. Now both of these things depend on God very much and on us not really at all. The truth can't be altered by someone believing it or not believing it. The truth is the truth is the truth and the truth is this. God created all things. He's the creator of the universe and all within it including you and me. And another truth is this, when we were far off and when we were falling and stumbling and going our own way and drifting away from God, God came to get us. He came himself in the person of Jesus, God with us. And he offered salvation. He died for our sins on the cross and he flung open his arms and welcomed all who had come to him. That's a message that I hope and pray you have received joyfully. And if you haven't, then I know all of the people at DBC are going to be praying that you come to a saving knowledge and understanding of the truth. Because when you have that, it is like a belt around your waist. It girds you. It holds everything together. It gives you core strength. The belt of truth. Righteousness is a similar thing. There is a breastplate of righteousness, but the news is I'm not a righteous man. In fact, no one is, or a righteous woman. We have fallen, we stumble, we are sinful, we are part of a sinful race. We fall short of the goodness God requires of us. It's really bad news, and yet, Jesus Christ gives us his righteousness. So this breastplate that Paul says all Christians should wear all the time is based on what Jesus has done for us, not on something that we do or have done. And for me, I breathe a sigh of relief because if it's down to me to do it, it's probably going to be a dodgy job. But if Jesus has done it, my breastplate of righteousness is firmly in place. Next, Paul refers to shoes of gospel readiness and the emphasis he places really is on that word readiness, a Greek word hoitomasia which means absolutely poised probably for sprinting or doing something like that. 
The image that comes to my mind when I hear that word and when I've studied a few things about it was the dreaded parents race when you go to your children's sports day. And sure enough, one of the mums is sat on the ground pulling on a pair of running spikes and you think, oh no, I'm going to struggle to compete because I'm wearing flip-flops. She is ready, she's poised, she's good to go and she's going to take that, uh, whatever it is, little commemorative cup. And this is how Paul describes how we must be with the gospel. In you and in me, our understanding of the gospel, our passion for the good news, our passion for sharing that good news has to be in a state of readiness. You can't miss an opportunity, or at least you should try not to, to share that good news. And this is what Paul, I think, is putting across so strongly here. We need to be understanding of what the Lord has done for us, clear about it, and know that we are ready to share it at the drop of a hat. Shoes of gospel readiness. The shield of faith. Now, Paul lived in a time when there was an awfully large amount of war. People were always battling and doing all sorts of things on the battlefield. And as you can imagine, there grew to be an enormous number of different types of protection and weapon used for war and they were all given different very very different very descriptive names so paul makes reference here to a tyrios shield now tyrios comes from a greek word tyra meaning door and a tyrios shield was absolutely enormous it was the size of a door it was like a, a police riot shield, but way bigger. And you stood behind it and lots of people carrying these things would lock together and you'd shuffle forwards and you might hear some noises and thumps and bangs on the other side of it, but it wasn't getting through to you. It was carrying a door along with a load of other people in a line also carrying doors. It was a remarkably effective means of protecting yourself. So Paul says that your Tyrios shield, the thing that you hide completely behind, that makes all the attacks just bing, bounce off, is your faith. What is faith? The writer to the Hebrews defined it like this. He said, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Let me read that again. It's confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Our precious word of God is filled with beautiful promises, facts that are applied to our lives when we invite Jesus in as Lord and Saviour. And when we do that, we sometimes forget that we are living in a new paradigm, that we are living in a state with lots of new and fresh and beautiful truths applied to us by God. We carry on just like we did before, but that's not a faithful way to live. The faithful way to live, according to the writer of Hebrews, is to live your life based upon the promises of God, taking them as absolute truth, that is in and of itself faithful. I am saved. I am safe. My body is the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit of God. I have the Holy Spirit within me and I am told he is greater than any spiritual thing that I will encounter in this world. And as I move forwards in those truths, in faith, it's like being behind the Tyrios, being behind the big door. It really does make the attacks just bounce off. Remember the beautiful promises and live them as a man or a woman of faith. Next, the helmet of salvation. Very similar to those first two pieces of armour, the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. The helmet of salvation doesn't depend 
on you or I in any way. It is a gift, a gracious gift from God through Jesus Christ. As we go through life, we think things wrong, we say things wrong, we do things wrong. And we are in debt because of it. We need that debt to be paid and cleared. We need the punishment we deserve for all that we've done wrong to be taken from us. That is salvation. And that's what Jesus does on the cross. Every person who embraces Christ is saved and is wearing a helmet, spiritually speaking. As you can see, I'm actually physically wearing a flat cap, but I've really got a helmet on. Finally, we come to the sword of the Spirit that is the Word of God. And this is the last part of the, the armour, the armament that we as Christians must take everywhere. The sword of the Spirit that is the Word of God. We also come to the last Greek word that I'm going to mention in our little film, and that word is makaira. Makaira is the word Paul uses for a sword, and it is a tiny little sword. It's a short sword, favoured by the Romans, but it wasn't always favoured by the Romans. They had a very, very simple understanding to begin with of what a sword should be like, and their thinking was the bigger the better. A great big sword that weighs a fair bit that you can really clout someone with, that's going to be the effective thing to do. But then a battle took place that I mentioned earlier in our series on Ephesians. Hannibal fought a battle against my all-time favourite Roman general, Scipio Africanus, and Hannibal won because Scipio's troops all had big swords, but Hannibal's were armed with the Machaera, these little swords. And very famously, after this defeat, Scipio called blacksmiths forward and had all of his men shorten their swords. And they retrained and they went back and they won. That was the Roman mentality and the mentality of my favourite general, Scipio. Why does Paul choose Machaera so specifically to talk about the sword of the Spirit that is the Word of God. Well, perhaps it is because the Word of God is a nimble, unexpectedly powerful thing. At the Word of the Lord, the universe came into being. We reflected on that right at the beginning. But at the Word of God, the Word which the Lord sets in your heart, the Word which the Lord can bring forth from your mouth, a person's life can be entirely changed. Evil can be defeated in a man or a woman's life when they hear the word of God. The kingdom comes in power and strength as people hear deeply, profoundly the word of God as it goes into their ears but then sinks deeper into their heart. It is a weapon as Paul describes it and yet it's nothing that we would expect to be a weapon. Nonetheless it is formidable and what a joy that every single Christian is given the great blessing of being able to wield it. We have to prayerfully make sure that we are wielding the sword of the Spirit that is the Word of God in our day-to-day -day conversations, like having feet shod with readiness to spread the gospel of truth, we need to know that the power is there for us from God himself. I hope these few reflections on the armour of God have been helpful to you and a blessing. I personally find it to be a very important thing to regularly look at that passage and to pray and reflect on each of those pieces and really pray them into place on my body, reassure myself that they are all there as I am about the different things that God calls me to do. Maybe it would help you to do the same. And Paul emphasises the importance of prayer in the final few words of the passage. I'll leave them with you today. Paul says, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. In Jesus' name, Amen.